Hi, I'm Norm Abram. Welcome to the New Yankee Workshop. But today we're going to build this beautiful shaker chair. The idea came from a visit to the Hancock Shaker Village. That's next, right here on the New Yankee Workshop. The New Yankee Workshop features the craftsmanship of Norm Abram. If you are really interested in seeing how the Shakers lived and worked, and taking a look at some of their pieces of furniture, then you really owe it to yourself to visit the Hancock Shaker Village, just outside of Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Now here in the brick dwelling are some of the most glorious examples of their craftsmanship. Now to the outside world, the Shakers were best known for their seeds and herbs, but right after that were their chairs. They were produced in factories and sold to the general public. And here's a few examples. This one has a beautiful tiger maple back with a woven fabric tape seat. This next one is similar except that it has a more decorative finial at the top of the back post. Now the curator tells me this is a very unusual chair because it has a tapered back slat. But this one over here is my personal favorite. It's just the right size. It's as light as a feather. And even though it appears to be very delicate, it is strong, yet elegant. Now, I must admit that I've really been putting off adding a chair to our collection. But now that I've found the right one, the question is, can I duplicate this quality of craftsmanship? Long before I built my first Shaker chair, this sign that hangs in the workshop was a daily reminder of the Shaker chair building craft. I hoped that they might find my version acceptable. For my first attempt at a chair, I'm pretty pleased with the results. It's light, it's very strong, and it's comfortable. Also, with that characteristic Shaker slant back that they used on their chairs, it's very elegant. Now, in my research, I found that most shaker chairs were made from maple, but occasionally you would hear about other woods, like cherry. And that's what I chose because I'm going to build several of these to go with the trestle table that I built a few years ago. Now, the seat is made from woven fabric tape, much like the shakers would have used. It's woven on both sides in between a foam pad. The tape we purchased at a store that specializes in shaker crafts. I'll show you how to weave the seat later. Now, if you'd like to build a few of these for your dining room, a measured drawing and a materials list is available. And you'll hear more about that before this program ends. I also want to take a moment to talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this. There is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. Now, to get started on our project today, I want to work on the rear slats. And as you can see, they are slightly curved. Now, the shakers would have steamed the wood and bent it around a form. But since we don't have a steam box here at the shop yet, I'm going to try a different approach. I'm going to laminate two thin pieces of wood to make that curve. So I'm going to start by taking this three-quarter inch cherry and ripping an eighth of an inch off of each face. You might have noticed how easily I cut through the cherry. The secret is in the blade. It's very sharp. It has a thin kerf, which means it doesn't have to remove a lot of wood, and it has an advanced tooth design. Okay, now here's the form that I'm going to use to bend those slats. It's just a piece of two and a quarter inch solid stock that I've bandsawn to the shape that I need. First, I'm just going to clamp one end 
to the jig. Okay, now the arch that I actually want is about five-eighths of an inch over the finished length of the piece, which is between these two lines. Now, because I know that this piece is going to spring back a little bit when I remove it from the clamps, I'm actually going to bend it about three-quarters of an inch. And a couple of spring clamps to pull the top edge tightly together. And we'll let this whole thing sit here and cook for a while and go to work on the lathe. This is when a long bed lathe really pays off. The back leg backrest portion of our chair is 42 and 3 quarters inches long. Now, if you don't happen to have a long bed lathe, you might go down to your local high school or trade school and rent some time on theirs. What I've done is mounted a blank in the lathe that's an inch and 5 eighths thick and knocked off the corners over at the table saw. I've also made a layout stick. And what that stick does is shows me where to mark the piece for the transition. A slight taper at the bottom. From here to the bottom of the finial, it's tapered. And then, of course, detail lines for the finial itself. The first thing that I want to do is turn this blank round. But I'm going to start more or less in the middle and just turn a small section so I can attach this device, which is a steady rest. It stops long, thin pieces like this from whipping as they turn. Okay, now let's attach that stabilizer. I'm going to line up the arms with the cut. Now with the steady rest in place, I can round the entire blank. Now that it's more or less round, now I'll lay it out. Now, with a little bit of fine sanding, I now have two pieces that are pretty good for the back of the chair. And since all the other parts of the chair are under three feet, I've installed my lathe duplicating attachment. All it really is is a cutter up at the front end here, which moves in and out, and also can be moved along the work by turning this wheel. And down at this end, there's a follower, which will ride up against the pattern or the original. And when I built the prototype, I made one original of each part. 
Now with this duplicator, the work is really fast. The back post of the chair and the front leg require several holes for the seat stretchers and these lower rungs. Now I'm going to start with this back post and drill the three holes that are along this side. Now you'll notice that these holes intersect the post at 95 degrees. The key to this whole project is a jig. Even the shakers had jigs. Here's the one I've made. It's constructed from plywood and it has holes for the various rungs and stretchers. And then up on this side, there's even slots to cut the mortises for the back slats. The inside square is an inch and a half, and that's so that it's just snug around the widest portion of the back slat. So I just slip it into place, let about an inch stick below the bottom, and take a couple shingles and just wedge it into place so it can't move. Now up on the other end, I've actually capped it and put another piece of plywood with a hole just large enough to let the top come through. And you see these marks right here? These are indicator marks. I want to key the post by putting a little pencil mark there. And we'll keep coming back to that and turning it for various holes. Then I'll just wedge the top with a couple little pieces. I'm going to drill the holes for the lower rungs using a 9 16 brad point bit in my drill press. I've also tilted the table to 5 degrees and installed this straight edge clamp as a fence. I've set the depth adjustment so the hole will go through the plywood and into the rung about 3 quarters of an inch. Now with that first hole drilled, just to make sure nothing moves around, I'm going to stick a piece of dowel in there. Now I know it won't move out of alignment. And now we can do the same operation to the other back post. Okay, now I'm going to switch to a three-quarter inch bit for the stretcher holes. This time I'm using a Forstner bit. Either a Forstner bit or a brad point is fine for any of these holes. The next set of holes that I want to drill are for this back stretcher and back rung. And if you look carefully, you'll see that this is not a 90 degree angle, it's a 100 degree angle. So I simply can't leave the piece in the jig and just flip it and drill these side holes because that only gives me 90 degrees. So what I'm going to do is pull the pin, and this is where that indicator mark comes in, and turn the piece 10 degrees, wedge it back in, and go to the drill press. Now over here at the drill press, I've readjusted the table so that it is now perpendicular to the bit. Now, because I have this canted portion on the jig to make the mortises for the slats, it won't sit perfectly flat on the table, so I'm using a piece of scrap wood as a spacer. Okay, I've now switched back to the 9 16 inch bit, and I'll drill the hole for the lower back rung. Now I'm ready to drill the holes on the front legs. 
But this angle is now 85 degrees, not 95 degrees. It's the complementary angle. So I've built another jig, just like the one for the back post, except I've made it a little bit bigger, an inch and five-eighths on the inside dimension because the front leg is a little bit fatter. I've reset the drill press and tipped the table to five degrees, and now I'm ready to drill the nine-sixteenths holes. Okay, now I'll switch to a three-quarter inch bit and drill the hole for the side stretcher. Now I'm ready to drill the holes for the front stretcher and rungs. And you'll notice that the angle to the side is 80 degrees, the complementary angle to this angle, which was 100 degrees. Now I've set the post in the jig the same way. The rotation is slightly different. You'll note that the guide holes in the jigs are drilled 90 degrees to one another. On the post, I wanted the angle to open, so I rotated the stock to get a wider angle. On the leg, I want the angle smaller, so I'll rotate it to reduce the angle. Okay, that takes care of all the holes for the rungs and stretches. Now we'll make the mortises for the slats. The mortises for the slats run along the center line of the post, but because the slat is slightly curved, the mortise has to be cut in at an angle. And I've calculated that angle to be eight degrees, which is equal to the angle of the wedge that I've attached to my jig. Now, if you're worried about all these dimensions, if you choose this method of construction, the jig will be shown in the measured drawings. I'm going to make the mortise using this quarter-inch spiral bit and this guide collar. It slips into the pre-made slot, and I'll just plunge the bit into the work. Okay, now I'm cutting out the slats with my jigsaw, and I laid out each piece with a paper pattern to show the form. Now all I have to do is smooth the edges with the drum sander, bevel them a little bit, and fit them in the mortises. It's just a matter of taking a rasp and fine-tuning each piece until it fits snugly in the mortise. Now with any excess trimmed off the turnings, I'm now just sanding them smooth. Now with a glue brush, some good carpenter's glue, a sponge, a soft mallet, and some clamps. It's just a matter of putting everything together.
Okay, well that takes care of the assembly. Now I think I'll let it set for a few hours and then I'll put a coat of Danish oil on. I have to do that before I can tape the seat. For the finish on the chair, I'm using a Danish finish. I just rub it into the wood, leaving the natural wood show through. And with this product, I can put on a coat about every 30 minutes. What I really like about it is that it's non-toxic and that I can clean up with just water. Now here's how I did the seat on the original prototype. I started with the dark colored tape, which is known as the warp. I tacked it to the underside of one of the seat stretchers. And now the idea is to just go around the front and back stretchers, keeping the tape parallel and tight. A little practice and a little patience is really all it takes. Now the idea is to sort of go over it a second time and pull these so that they're taut, but not so much that you actually bow the stretches. Okay, that's nice and tight. Now with it turned over, I'm going to secure the end to the opposite stretcher. Well, now I'm just taking a piece of one inch foam and sliding it in between the rows of fabric tape. Well, now we're ready to start in with the lighter color, which is referred to as the woof, and we'll weave that top and bottom. Now I've pushed the center piece of tape off to the side. I'm going to tack on the lighter tape and then just slip it back over again. Now I'm ready to start weaving. Now it's just a matter of going over, under, over, under all the way around. Well, now with all of the woof except the last three rows complete, I want to finish up these triangular corners, which are part of the warp. So I just use two short pieces that I weave through, and then I'll tack in such a way that the tacks will be hidden, run it over the top, and weave the bottom. Boy, the weave is really getting tight now. All right, well, the woof ends up in the middle of the front stretcher. And I've tacked it in place, and I'll just slip the other tape over it. And this chair is finished and ready for some heavy-duty sitting.
Norm Abram is the author of the book, The New Yankee Workshop, which is available in bookstores and libraries nationwide.